Hello, welcome to Ask Truth Apologetics. I am here to do a response video to, um, to, uh, Who are you? The Free Amigos! <laughs> no, that's not right. It's the, um, oh, the, it's the, it's the three, three Muslim. The Free Amigos! No, seriously, guys, it says it. It's the three Muslims. The three Muslims. Yeah, I know the, the, the Quran says to say not three and to stop it, but... Christianity, just from the get-go, doesn't really make sense. And I'm just going to summarize it with this circular <laughs> reasoning <laughs> that, that they use. Man, go in. <laughs> Bismillah. So God creates man, and from man comes woman. And then we have this long line of, you know, generations and generations, and no God coming down, incarnation, trinity, none of that, until we get to Jesus. And then all of a sudden, woman gives birth to God, who God created, right? Gives birth to God. And then God is murdered by man to save man from God's punishment. You keep using the word. I don't think it means what you think it means. So you're saying that um, God never came down? It's almost as if the Bible that I'm reading right now in Genesis 18 verses 1 to 3 says, And Yahweh appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre, and he was sitting in the doorway of the tent and the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, three men were standing near him. And he saw them and ran from the doorway of the tent to meet them. And he bowed down to the ground and he said, my Lord, if I have found favor in your eyes, do not pass by your servant. It also says here in the in the Bible, uh, also the, in Genesis thirty two thirty, 30, that Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, which means I have seen God face to face and my life was spared but wait if i turn the in exodus chapter 3 verse 4 it says and yahweh saw that he turned aside to see and god called to him from the midst of the bush and he said moses moses and he said here i am well it's like man i i keep reading exodus 13 21, it says, and Yahweh was going before them by day in a column of cloud to lead them and on the way and by night in the column of fire to give light to them to go by day and night. Um, you know, it also says that uh, God appeared to Job out of a whirlwind. Uh, wow. That's strange, but maybe, maybe we need to read the Quran. It says here in the Quran, and has the story of Musa come to you when he saw fire? And he said to his family, stop, for surely I see a fire. Haply, I may bring to you therefrom a live coal or find guidance at the fire. So when he came to it, a voice was uttered. Oh, Musa, surely I am your Lord. Therefore, put off your shoes. Hmm. Advice. And it's just this giant circular reasoning, circular argument that doesn't really make sense. And on top of that, they're going to argue that this one God that's always been one God in one person 
all of a sudden is three and one. And it's, I was going to make a joke. I'm not going to make that joke. But all of a sudden they're coming out and saying, no, no, I'm actually three and one. Right? I'm not one unipersonal God. I'm a triune God. This doesn't really make sense because even in the Bible, it says God is not the author of confusion. So why all of a sudden are you doing this back and forth? And even if you read the Bible, Jesus never teaches the Trinity. Every time, the, okay, I'll just summarize it with this. A Jewish man came and asked Jesus, what is the most important commandment? He said, hear, O Israel, your Lord God is one. Worship him with all your heart, your soul, your mind. He, this would be the perfect time to teach the Trinity. Listen, I'm the son of God. Literally, I'm going to die for your sins. And there's the Holy Spirit. There's the Father. And we're three in one. And he never says this. When he's directly asked, he doesn't say it. So, mm -hmm. and we can see the, the ambiguity throughout Christian history, so on and so forth. And this is not to hate on Christianity. This is just my findings when I looked into it. Because yes, I did look into it. Sponge. How's everything look? Looks good. Looks real good. What's his BP? 120 over 80. Okay, folks. Close him up. You're not Dr. Stewart. No. But I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. Oh, um, so Jesus was asked, what is the most important commandment? And he responded by saying, the Lord, your God is one. Wow. I don't even know what to say. Checkmate. Oh, wait a second. Let me go ahead and keep reading the verse. So it says that the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and there is no other besides him. Let's keep reading. And then Jesus said, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And then Jesus proceeded to teach. And he said, How can the scribes say that Christ is the son of David? David himself, in the Holy Spirit, declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David calls himself Lord. So how is he his son. And the great throng heard him gladly. It's almost as if Jesus is telling us how we should understand Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. So if the Lord is the son of David, then how can he be the Lord of David? It's almost as if this Lord is both God and the son of God. And it's almost as if the scribe was close to the kingdom of heaven, but not all the way in the kingdom of heaven. And I wonder why Jesus would then add that immediately after he had the discussion with the scribe. It's almost as if Jesus is teaching us Oh, I don't know how to get all the way into the kingdom of God. And checking my notes here, it also says, or he said, that even the Bible says that God is not the author of confusion. Uh, well, first of all, you're going to tell us a little bit more about what you think of the Bible. And then you're also going to tell us a little bit more what you think of Paul. And as I recall, that verse of the Bible was written by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. Now, Muslims always tell us that if we misunderstand something uh, in their Quran, that it's just because we're reading it in a translated language and we're not actually going to the Arabic. So let's go ahead and A, first of all, assume that Paul is actually an authentic author of the Bible and he's representing Christianity appropriately. And B, let's look into the Greek. Let's see how he first wrote it. So what's oftentimes translated as confusion 
according to the Strong's Concordance, is a word that is called ekastasia, ekastasia, okay, which is the definition of instability. Uh, it could be used in a variety of ways, according to Strong's Concordance, disturbance, upheaval, revolution, almost anarchy, first in the political and thence in the moral sphere. So we can think about this in terms of instability, right? But even if we use it in the terms of the author of confusion, I, I want to give you a simple rhetorical question. Is trigonometry confusing? Hmm. Um, is, does that mean because trigonometry is confusing that it does not point to, oh, I don't know, a correct answer or the truth? Well, I think it does. So moving on to your next point. You said that Jesus never taught that he was the son of God. Wait a minute. The Bible says something. No, this couldn't be possibly true. Because this Muslim told us about our Bible and we should know that he's always going to be honest and represent the truth accurately and perfectly. Right? I mean, that's just honest of them that's not deceptive not like their god is deceptive or anything anyway um here in uh matthew chapter 16 verse 15 starting out in verse 15 and he jesus said to them but who do you say that i am simon peter replied you are the christ the son of the living god did he say son of the living God? Did he say son of the living God? Jesus, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. He did say that. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So, not only does Jesus affirm that Peter is correct in calling him the son of the living God, Jesus also affirms that his father in heaven was the one who revealed this to Peter. Hmm. I don't even know what to say at this point. But anyway, moving on, um, what are some other points? He said that Jesus never said that I'm going to die for your sins, but he also said that he stayed at a Holiday Inn Express last night and that he looked into it. So did he really even stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night? Did he even really actually, I don't know, look into it? It's almost as if he forgot to read Mark chapter 10, verse 45, where Jesus says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I, I, sounds to me like he's saying that he's giving his, his life as a ransom for many. Uh, it's almost as if... Jesus had a conversation here with Nicodemus in John chapter 3, where he quite literally says that Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so too must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. <sighs> this is just condemning to you the three amigo muslims you guys are a joke and it's quite embarrassing to you uh to your community uh what low level argumentation styles and tactics that you've been using um this is 
internet level stuff, which shouldn't, shouldn't surprise me because we are well on the internet, but anyone who has ever looked into it would know that the arguments that you are bringing forth are absolutely pathetic. When I looked into it, because yes, I did look into it. In the Bible itself, it does not seem to be authentic or authoritative as a historical text for many reasons. And it's basically scholarly consensus that it has not been preserved. It has not been, it's, it's not infallible. It's not inerrant. It has been changed. And um, I can quote scholars if people want to hear that, but it's basically scholarly consensus at this point. You can quote scholars too. Wow, I can quote scholars as well. I can even quote your favorite Imam Bart Ehrman on this exact subject of the preservation of the Bible. Let's go ahead and see what Bart Ehrman has to say. He says, Essential Christian beliefs are not affected by textual variants in the manuscript tradition of the New Testament. Let's see what else is written from Imam Bart Ehrman. Ehrman and Metzger state that in the book, that we can have a high degree of confidence that we can reconstruct the original text of the New Testament, the text, the text that is in the Bible we use because of the abundance of textual evidence we have to compare. The variations are largely minor and don't obscure our ability to construct an accurate text. This is the fourth edition of his work that was published in two uh, 1005, the same year Ehrman Ir- published Misquoting Jesus, which relies on the same body of information and offers no new different evidence to state the opposite conclusion. What else does Bart Ehrman say? Well, his teacher, he t- talks about this. Bruce Metzger is one of the great scholars of modern times, and I dedicated the book to him because he was both my inspiration for getting into textual criticism and the person who trained me in the field. I have nothing but respect and admiration for him. And even though we may disagree on important religious questions, because he is a firmly committed Christian and I am not, we are in complete agreement on a number of very important historical and textual questions. If he and I were put in a room and asked to hammer out a consensus statement on what we think the original text of the New Testament probably looked like, there would be very few points of disagreement maybe one or two dozen places out of many thousands. The position I argue for in misquoting Jesus does not actually stand at odds with Professor Metzger's position that the essential Christian beliefs are not affected by textual variants in the manuscript tradition of the New Testament. I'm going to read that again. The essential Christian beliefs are are not affected by textual variants in the manuscript tradition of the New Testament. So, what are we seeing here, folks? We're seeing that, well, he quoted no scholars, and I quoted at least their favorite imam and atheist, Bart Ehrman, on the particular subject. And Bart Ehrman says that uh, the New Testament is, paraphrasing here, well-preserved. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Before you even ask the question, what was that joke? I can't. This whole, this whole like man made, I guess, concept of Trinitarianism, you're saying it wasn't even in the Old Testament. Not at all. Not at all. Well, I want you to go into that. And the second thing is, Islamically speaking, Jesus or Isa salam, was sent Isa. here to spread a message to a specific time and at a specific place. Not to be some universal message. Yes. Right? Yes. A hundred percent. Yes. And this is even mentioned in the Bible, as it says in the Bible that Jesus said, I did not come from anyone except for the lost sheep of Israel, or I only came for the lost sheep of Israel, which means he's only coming to the Jews. He's only gone to the Jews and you quoted the Bible. Ah! Sometimes I honestly don't know. What goes through your heads? I mean, I know you looked into the Bible and all this kind of stuff. You know what you're talking about because you did look into it. However, aside from the fact that Jesus healed, oh, I don't know, a whole bunch of Gentiles, centurions, Samaritans, uh, Greek speakers, like he healed all of them, uh, that he didn't come for them, apparently, according to you. Uh, 
Um, he's making a generalized statement and not a specific statement. But if you want to hear a specific statement from Jesus regarding going only to the lost sheep of Israel, what are you going to do with Matthew chapter 28, verses uh, 18 and 19? Let's see here. And Jesus came to them and said, this was, by the way, after he was crucified. You remember that one time when he was crucified and he was uh, buried for three days and he rose again from the dead that your Quran denies? Anyway, this is from that, that Bible um, that completely contradicts your Quran, which your Quran says that our Bible and the Torah and the Injil are a guidance and a light. And, and even that uh, Muhammad, your prophet, should go to the Bible and the people who know the Bible if he has any questions. Um, so here I am, a person of the Bible. And uh, here's my answer to you, to the only the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of only the lost sheep of Israel. Oh, no, it doesn't say that. Huh. It says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of what? The name of the Father. I thought there, the God is not a father to anyone. Hmm. And of the Son. Well, I thought God couldn't possibly be a son. And of the Holy Spirit. I thought that Jesus never mentioned the Holy Spirit and them as, as being able to forgive and cleanse people of their sins, like what baptism is for. So baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe, observe all that I have commanded you. You need to teach them to observe all that God has commanded you. Because only God is the one who can bring down these sorts of rules. But wait a minute. Unless, unless Jesus is God, which he is, he couldn't have said, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. How can... How can Jesus be with us always to the end of the age? It's almost as if he promised that if he went away, that he would send a comforter to us, right? He would send the Holy Spirit to us uh, by whom, I'm trying to think what the Bible says here. It says that um, all that the Father has is mine. So if the Father is God and Jesus has everything that the Father has, um, then that would make what? Jesus God? Oh, it would, wouldn't it? Hmm, interesting, right? But then Jesus goes on and he says that um, that the comforter will take from what is Jesus and um, he will declare it to you. So let's go ahead and do a real simple deductive syllogy here. So if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. So if Jesus has everything the Father has and that makes Jesus God, and then if everything that Jesus has, he gives to the comforter, then that would make the comforter also God, right? So we got A, the Father, God, B, the Son, God, and C, the Son, Holy Spirit. Different persons, but they all have one thing in common. I wonder, I wonder what that is. Maybe you can guess. So who went to the Gentiles, the non-Jews? Paul did. Paul never met Jesus. Paul never met Jesus. Paul never met Jesus. And all of a sudden he's preaching these things that Jesus never preached, dying for sins. And he is literally the son of God in the Trinity and this, that, the other. Where is this coming from? It's coming from a man who never met Jesus, who didn't even preach to people who had knowledge of the scripture. He preached to non-Jews who didn't know the Bible, who didn't know uh, what the prophets of the past have written and what has been uh, put in the old, or in the Torah. Now, Paul and Barnabas um, were over here preaching, and on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue. I couldn't be right, because the synagogue is a, is a place where Jewish people congregate. So they went into the synagogue and sat down, and after reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up 
and then motioning with his hand, he said, men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. But he literally just said, our three Muslim musketeer guy, he just said that Paul never went to talk to the Jews. Hmm. So, and, and as they went out, so it's at the end of it, and as they went out, the people begged that these things might be told to them on the next Sabbath. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas. Hmm. But you're right. I guess, uh, I guess they never, they never, uh, they never went to the Jews, apparently, right? Um, let's see here. But maybe these were Jews who didn't know the Bible well. You ever think about that? I mean, maybe maybe you didn't. So, wait a minute. I'm reading this here. The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the um, Gentile synagogue. No, it says they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Gentiles were more noble. Oh, no, wait, it doesn't say Gentiles either. It says these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness. And then they did something very interesting that our Muslim friend said didn't happen. Uh, with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were, were so. But you're right. Paul only went to the Gentiles, and he only taught people who didn't know anything about the Bible. Idiot. So, mm. completely, with all due respect to Christians, in my humble opinion, completely fabricated on Paul's part. Completely fabricated on Paul's part? Uh, how about that one time when you used one of Paul's words to try to make a point to degrade the Bible? That part counted, but the rest of it totally fabricated. Um, and then we have the matter of the Trinity in the Old Testament. Even James White, who is a Christian scholar himself, a highly respected Christian scholar, he says that if you're going to look for the Trinity, don't look for it in the Old Testament because it's not there. That's why we can make sense out of the Bible. It says no one has seen God any time. Yeah, but they did. Abraham walked with Yahweh by the oaks of Mamre. But what, does he have his eyes closed or something? What, what, what's going on? No, the one who revealed the Father to us in the Old Testament is the Son. In fact, that's one of the greatest evidences of the deity of Christ. Remember when God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah? Have you ever noticed that in Genesis chapter 19? Remember what had happened? Abraham had been walking with with Yahweh, and he was, he was basically trying to cut a deal with him. Uh, 50 people? What if, what if there are 50 people? Well, how about 40? Man, I've been thinking about Sodom and Gomorrah. I don't think there are 40. Um, 30? Uh, 20? Remember, he's trying to get, get God to spare. And he finally gets down to a point where, like, uh, if there's not that many, then, oh, well, so much for a lot. And so he's been walking with Yahweh. And when it, time comes for judgment to fall, you ever notice what Genesis 19, I think it's verse 24 says? Yahweh rained fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah from Yahweh in heaven. The Yahweh who had been walking with Abram brings the fire and the brimstone from Yahweh in heaven. Oh, you've got multiple Yahwehs. No, there's only one Yahweh. There, there is almost nothing more clearly revealed in all of Scripture than there is only one Yahweh. Before me, there is no God formed. There will be none after me. Is there any other God besides me? Yahweh says, I know of none. There's one God, Yahweh. But in Genesis, Yahweh walks with Abram and rains fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah. Who is that Yahweh that's walking? Remember when Jesus was about to, the, the Jews were just about to pick up stones to stone him in John chapter 8? Remember what he said to them? Abram, Abram saw my day and he rejoiced to see it. And the Jews were like, you're not even 50 years old. 
How could Abram see your day? And what was, what was Jesus' response? Prin Abraham genestai ego aimi. Before Abraham was, I am. Ego aimi, Greek phrase for the Hebrew words anahu, which Yahweh uses of himself over and over again in the Hebrew scriptures. They pick up stones to stone him because they know exactly what it is that he has just claimed. When did Abraham see his day? Well, he walked with him by the oaks of Mamre. And so you start to see that the reason the New Testament revelation of the Trinity is found in scattered allusions and the ease of language is not because it's not central, it's not because it's not important, it's because the revelation is being given in such a way that it's coming through people who are already self-conscious Trinitarians. They may not use that term Trinitarian, but they know that the one God, Yahweh, has done something absolutely astonishing. In the person of his son, he has entered into his own creation. And the only way for me to really go in depth on it is to, is to try and use one of their arguments and counteract it. So God is called Elohim in the Old Testament. And Elohim is actually the plural word for gods, multiple gods. And they say, see, it says, let, like, and it uses terms like, let us create man in our image, right? And that's like, oh, plural. There's multiple. That's in Hebrew, right? That's in Hebrew, yes, but that's translated to English. And Elohim is a word for God, like I mentioned, that is actually plural, which means multiple gods. Well, in the Bible itself, it does not seem to be authentic or authoritative as a historical text. But when you add I am basically to the end of a word or an end of a name or something in Hebrew, it's actually for respect. For example, Muhammadim, right? That's in the Bible. In the Bible itself, it does not seem to be authentic or authoritative as a historical text, right? That's in the Bible. And it means the beloved one. And when you add, Muh when you add the I am sound at the end, it's basically saying, like out of respect or majesty or something like that of that matter, we would consider it the royal. Perhaps they didn't use that terminology. Perhaps they didn't use that terminology. Um, and perhaps that actually matters. And perhaps the royal we was not even invented until the Byzantine Empire was in power, which was around uh, the 4th century AD, um, which is A, a completely different language than Hebrew, and B, I don't know, about 1,500 years after the um, Torah was written. So when there is a royal we or a plural of majesty, guess what, hombre? That's not a thing. You're back projecting things into history. <laughs> Who knew? Oh, by the way, speaking of back projecting things into history, uh, you remember that one time when, when your Quran said that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was the uh, sister of Aaron and the daughter of Imran? But, but really, there's another historical biblical figure that actually did have a brother named Aaron and a father named Imran, and that was Mary, the uh, sister of Moses, 1,500 years before uh, the Mary, mother of Jesus, existed. <laughs> but I guess history doesn't actually matter. Go, go, go ahead. Go on. But regardless, it's to basically say God is God in the full sense of the word. Because you have verses that say the God of gods. And it literally says Elohim of Elohim. So you have two possible translations, multiple gods or one God in the full sense of the word. How about no, Scott, okay? And how do we differentiate between the two? When it's talking about one God alone, the noun or the name Elohim is plural. But the verb is singular. For example, create or bestow or send or something. These verbs would be singular, while the name Elohim is plural, making God one. And Christians look at it and say, oh, since it's plural, it's the Trinity. But this actually doesn't make sense because Elohim would mean multiple gods, not multiple people inside a God. It would mean multiple gods. So you would either have to concede to the fact that Trinity is just polytheism and believing in multiple gods, 
or you would have to drop this argument, which most Christians nowadays, I would say they have dropped it because it is a very weak argument. And most of the Christian scholars don't go there anymore because they know that it doesn't make sense. Scott, you just don't get it, do you? You don't. It's no hassle. But I'm, all I'm saying, they're going to get a... I, I'm just... Which, which, knock, knock. Who's there? Shh. Look, Shh. let me tell you a little story about a man named Shh. Shh. Even before you start, that was a preemptive Shh. Just know I have a whole bag of Shh with your name on it. Yeah, let me, let me chime in here, right? So the Trinity claims that it's all the same thing, that the Father... Uh, the Holy Spirit and Jesus are all the same thing. It's all God, which doesn't make sense. I just logically, anyone in their logical mind will say that that doesn't make sense, right? And when I was into Christianity, let me show y'all. Actually, let me just repeat this. So in the Bible, in John 14, 28, it says, you heard that I said to you, I go away and I will come to you. If you love me, you would have rejoiced because I go to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. If the Father is greater than I, well, then that means that the Father is God and Jesus is not. Yeah, man. I mean, it's like if if the... It, if the father is greater than the son, man, then that means that uh, that the father is God, man, and the the son is not, bro. Because if the father, because the father, I know that the um, I, so you see what, so you see what, <laughs> what I'm trying to say is, uh, uh, even though my Quran says that uh, he's not a father to anybody. He's, Maybe he's a father, you know what I'm saying? I mean, maybe he's the godfather. Yeah, that's what he's talking about here. Yeah, and I know I just went from, like, a different... Uh, I'm going flexing between two different... Uh, uh, multiple different uh, accents, but that's just how I do it, man. You know, so it's like, hey, man, you know, the father is not God. No, the father is God. I'm sorry. I, just, I messed up what I was trying to say there. The father is God because... Uh, because if the father, you see, if the father is greater than the son, then the son uh, is not as great as the father. So if the father's better than this, you know what I'm saying? Okay. Because like, so here's the thing I want to try to, I, I want to try to tell everybody is I want to try to say to them, if your father is a person and a human being, uh, and he's greater than his son, who's not a human being, you know, because, uh, oh no, wait, it's different than that. All right. And trying to say is... Um, the father is greater than the son in authority because that's the nature of a father. Huh. Well, it's almost as if our Bible here also also says that uh, the father and I are one. It's almost as if I've read verses to say that everything the father has is mine. It's like, you know, if if I just pick these uh, what do they call them P picking out these cherries and such uh so yeah your entire argument is completely invalid <laughs> yeah subhanallah there's no way for them to be equal if one is greater this is the verse that christian uh um church fathers struggled with for centuries i would say because it's so clearly against what they believe well let's see what the nicene creed has to say about this struggle i believe in one god the father almighty maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible and in one lord jesus christ the son of god the only begotten begotten of the father before all worlds light of light very God of very God, begotten, not made, of one essence with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit, and 
the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate, and suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. But nonetheless, it is in their scripture. So, subhanAllah, I don't want to spend the entire session just ripping Christianity. <laughs> you won't, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you go, but so, tell, tell us, why don't you tell us about the Ebionites? The Ebionites, okay. So the Ebionites were one group of people that didn't believe that Jesus was God or the literal son of God. They believed he was a man, a uh, messenger. I believe they believed he was a Messiah as well, but they did not believe he was a God or son of God. Um, I would say the same is uh, the same goes for many of his disciples. They didn't seem to believe he was God either. The only one making the distinction would be Paul, who never met Jesus. Um, All right, well, let's first tackle the Ebionite issue that he brought up as if somehow that strengthens the possibility that Islam is the correct religion. So let's go ahead and look at some of the little known facts about the Ebionites. So most of the features of the Ebionite doctrine were anticipated in the teachings of the early Qumran sect as revealed in the Dead Sea Scrolls. They believed in one God and taught that Jesus was the Messiah and was the true prophet mentioned in Deuteronomy 18, 15. Not your Muhammad, it was Jesus. They rejected the virgin birth of Jesus. Not in your Quran. Ha <laughs> ha, they're not anywhere near Muslims. Instead, holding that he was the natural son of Joseph and Mary. The Ebionites believed Jesus became the Messiah because he obeyed the Jewish law. Apparently, he didn't speak from the cradle or turn clay bird or clay into real life living birds by breathing into them. Uh, they themselves faithfully followed the law, although they removed what they regarded as interpolations in order to uphold their teachings, which included vegetarianism, holy poverty, ritual ablutions, hey, that sounds Muslim to me, and the rejection of animal sacrifices. The Ebonites held uh, Jerusalem in great veneration. Hmm. Sounds to me like your idea of what an Ebionite is and what actual Ebionites were doesn't really fit your narrative, unless, of course, you keep doing what you've been doing, which is remove all the stuff that completely disagrees with your own religion, and then keep in like the one or two things that you do agree with. Now, moving on to the second point of this last clip here is he's talking about how Paul, Paul, this evil, evil person, was the only one who ever said that Jesus was God, except for Mark, which says that Jesus was God, Matthew, which says that Jesus was God, Luke, which says that Jesus was God, um, and John, which says that Jesus was God, and Acts that says that Jesus was God, and even in a couple of different letters that say that Jesus was God. And with it found within the text of the Bible, we can read that, oh, I don't know, Doubting Thomas says in John 20, 28, uh, he calls Jesus my Lord and my God. And if we're going to leave Paul out of this, let's move on to 2 Peter 1, 1, with by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, we can even move on to the book of Revelations, which says that uh, Jesus is the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, which is the same exact thing that uh, God the Father denotes to himself. And, and as a matter of fact, your Quran says that Allah is the first and the last. So let's see, all of those authors of the Bible declared um, that Jesus is God. So you have literally not said a single factual statement in this whole review. Thank you for exposing uh, Islam as being a completely false ideology. And thank you for allowing me to um, explain how Christianity is the true religion.